Hello, Jim. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How you doing, Aaron? Good. Just uh, doing all the dart things and um, looking forward to another session. Going through functions. Let's jump in. See what we can break today. Okay, Dart functions. Yeah, let's just do it. It's a it's a pretty small section. Uh, the next one's on comments. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, it shouldn't be too too strenuous. But then again, these usually go pretty long. So it says we recommend specifying the types of each function's argument and return value. Okay, so before we get into all that, a function is a way to define logic. Uh, how to do something in your program. A reusable piece of code. Also reusable, meaning every time you call it, it's like an inherently reusable, right? It's a, uh, it's a black box that takes in inputs, does something, produces outputs. Yeah, I guess you could have just one giant file and that could be your entire program. Sure. And it's going to execute regardless from top to bottom. Yeah. So you, you might not even need functions if you write your code in a certain way, but if you want to break it out into classes and, and um, yeah, but files, for modules. readability purposes, for reusability purposes, mm -hmm. maintenance purposes, it's mm -hmm. best to use functions. Yeah. And even, even parts of functions could be um, separated out like this line here this could be separated out into its own function and you mm -hmm. could give it a name. Um, okay. The first line of this section is quite interesting. It says, we recommend specifying the types of each function's arguments and return values. Mm -hmm. So does that mean return values are optional? Let's find out. Over to Dart Dev we go. I ask that because in C sharp, for example, there are such things as void functions where mm -hmm. the function just does something, executes a side effect of whatever, mm -hmm. and then doesn't return anything. Oh yeah, of course there's void, the main function. There you go. Yeah. So I guess that is kind of like a return type. Okay. So when they said we recommend specifying the types of each function's arguments, and return value. Okay, so there are, and return value, okay. So there's two places, the functions arguments and the return value. So let's look at the functions arguments. So these are the things in here. Can you see that? Let me zoom in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, it says we recommend, like you could do this and just have positional arguments. You could say in, let's say YZ, X for some reason is out, not being, not doing anything. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm used to, and, and I guess you would, you would name things a certain way. Like if this was a name, this was like some yellow and zebra, like you might know what that is, but maybe these are sure. objects, maybe that's, a, a string and but maybe the name is like a number because we we call people by numbers for some reason um yeah it doesn't really tell us what the type is and because darts what strongly typed is that a correct statement it is strongly typed okay so if we're going to use in here like because we're writing this to be um the the type of logic that works with an integer we need to pass an integer in I think you can just use in and, and that will work. So let's say we still need our main function in addition to this function we just wrote, but we are going to, we need to actually plop this into the main function and we'll get rid of this last print statement. Um, actually, what we could do is print the result. Okay. And Come back and format everything so you can read it a little bit easier. Right. Now I don't I don't actually know about this. <laughs> so I've defined a function in a function. Maybe we don't do that, right? Um 
Yeah, that doesn't look good. You're typically supposed to define a function elsewhere and then call it from another function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You define a function within a class. Right. Yeah. So I'm going to define this out here. Main should know about it, even though it executes top to bottom. Um, we're going to call Fibonacci like so and pass it in a number like five because that's what it's expecting. Um, and then it's returning a number. So it's going to, we could assign the number it returns. For example, like this dude, this result, this can actually go in here, right? Yeah, okay. There we go. And then we can print the result. So that, that looks more like um, the way we would do that. And let's just pretty this up. Um, okay. Yes. All right, let's see what happens. Let's run this. Okay, six, seven, six, five. Sounds right to me. It's also um, possible to print directly Fibonacci of 20. Mm. Without, yeah. Yeah, That's without an uh, intermediary variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we'll keep this just for readability. I know some people, they like to assign it and then print it. Um, okay. I wanted to look at the function arguments. Okay. So we called this with uh, 20 in here and you're like, okay, I guess Fibonacci takes a single integer. Uh, and then you look here and you're like, okay, it returns an integer, but it's, it's really in here that that's kind of like where you do that. Um, whenever I see this, it's, it's a bit, it seems a bit verbose for my taste. And I, I, I do like that things are typed and you know what's going in there. But when you uh -huh. look at a, um, you know, a, a method that takes a lot of arguments or something in your IDE and it, it, you look at the documentation, it just seems overwhelming to see like map, like object, object. You see all these things and there's like, there's your map that you're passing in. Sure. <laughs> and then maybe you got a list of like uh, ints and you call that a list. It's just like, it's a whole lot to see all this jargon here instead of just like in map list, you know what I mean? And so for me, I'm still like getting used to seeing mm -hmm. the, the type annotation in the argument list. You give up readability for lack of ambiguity, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and the, the, the nice thing, so like I use RubyMime, um, for my job uh, uh, writing in Ruby and Ruby on Rails. And, and the nice thing about that IDE, RubyMine, is that whenever I hover over like one of these, these things, uh, these arguments, whether it's here or it's like down here, like it, it tells me what the, the annotation is. Like it tells me the type. It'll even like fill it in as if it's text in the method when I'm calling it but it's just kind of like there as a helper. So I get the benefit of type annotation because RubyMine's doing that work for me. I don't have to do it as a, um, as a developer myself. Um, I mean, from my world, C Sharp and Java, those two languages are lower level compared to Ruby or Python, for example. Mm -hmm. and it's still old school like that where you have to specify the type okay so you're calling it old school and darts a new language and darts darts keeping it old school basically darts keeping it old school that's right <laughs> borrowing right. from those that came before yeah so so i guess just like classes have inheritance even dart inherited as a language itself um some of this behavior and the look and feel, right? Um, okay, so that's what that means saying 
we recommend specifying the type of each function's arguments. Um, so again, not required, but recommended. And then also the return value, specify the type of the return value. Now, when I come into this as a newbie, I'm thinking, oh, specify the type of the return value. So it's returning an int, right? I should specify it there or something. Um, but I think what that Not means so. is- The return the type, type is specified in the corner. The initial right here, definition right? of the function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so, so again, we don't have to. Yeah, see, so it's an info message that we get. It's not an error. Um, and I guess you could do the same thing for main in that case, right? Yeah, we just have two info things. Function main should have a return type. It doesn't. This function has a... So it's the same um, little error. Let's see if they have any more good information. Do declare method return types. When declaring a method or function, always specify a return type. Declaring return types for functions helps improve your code base by allowing the analyzer, okay? So the analyzer is not part of the IDE in Android Studio or VS Code. The analyzer I think is in the Dart SDK, right? Um, and I guess that's made use by the IDE or is it like actually when you compile it, it, it does the, the analyzing. Yeah, this is that compiled. This message, it looks like um, the checking happens during runtime. Mm, I read that differently. So I read it checks your code for errors that could occur during runtime. Run so like before time. So like it's compiled. I put it on a, a floppy disk. There you go. A <laughs> USB stick. And, uh, or I emailed the, the, the package to you, right? Um, that's been compiled. You open it and run it. But because I didn't put in my, my type annotations, all of a sudden you run it and it crashes because for some reason the analyzer didn't pick it up during compile time. Does that make sense? Am I reading that wrong? It's hard to interpret. My interpretation, it just means that that if you specify it, the analyzer during whenever you run it, we'll be able to pick it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're probably saying the same thing. So whether it's ran with the ahead of time thing. So for example, the way I see this, there is an analyzer that is part of either this environment or it's part of the Dart SDK itself and it's made, made use by this environment. So um, but we haven't run our program yet. So it's not, this is, this is pre run time. It has, <clears throat> it has analyzed the code. So that's, that's how I see it. Um, but I mean, whether, whether it does it before or during, um, let's see what happens after you run it without, uh, specifying the return on the function signature. Mm -hmm. Same result. So it works, but maybe maybe the analyzer took longer to do its analysis. Maybe there were other code paths where if we had specified the return type, you know, void and also in down in Fibonacci, maybe the analyzer doesn't take as long because we've given it the things it needs and it doesn't have to go figure it out. You know, that could be something cool to do is set up a, an experiment where you have like a pretty complicated program Mm -hmm. do one with specified types, do another one without it and, and see the performance on, on a compilation. Um, Just like or, the documentation says, it's recommended yeah. but not required. Yeah. So for me, coming from a, a Ruby on Rails world where you have an, an opinionated framework, you know, convention over configuration, they've said the convention is to always return a specified type. So I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid and just be dogmatic about it and be like, this is the gospel. You don't argue with it. You don't question it. Um, and then, you know, everything's going to be okay. Right. Right. Whereas 
from C sharp, you have to specify the return type. You have to specify parameter types. You have to specify all types. Otherwise, you get work. used to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, and that language is required as opposed required. to recommended. Okay, so if you did, if you had um, whatever this website is, because my thing's blocking it, I can't read it. Oh, Jesus. Um, Dar dot dev. If you had like C sharp dot dev, you wouldn't get a little info message. You get the red. Correct. It would say something like, "The type is missing." Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Cool. Um. Yeah. Recommend specifying the types. Okay. Um, if you don't know the types, you know, sometimes we're, we're yeah, coming from two different worlds. In that you're more used to Ruby, where there is totally more freedom compared to C sharp. Whereas coming from a C sharp background, everything is uh, lack of ambiguity, uh, very structured. You mm -hmm. have to specify everything, like the return types and so on. Mm -hmm. And then coming to a Dart language where there's less restrictions, it's like, ah, a little bit of taste of freedom. Mm -hmm. Whereas compared to Ruby, you ha it's already that freedom, right? Mm -hmm. But now you're like, oh man, now I have to put on these little handcuffs, you know, no matter how <laughs> small they are. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of order though, because it's, it's kind of like, like you previously, so let's take a rock climbing example. Previously, you got to drive to like the recreation center, or the the mountain where the rock where the rock is, and you got to just like look up at it and be like, "Oh, that's cool," um, and you're totally safe. Whereas, like on the Ruby side, maybe I was climbing the rock wall without any safety gear, right? The no harness, no no ropes, <laughs> just like go up and and hope you don't uh, mess up. Um, because when you do, your user gets an error message like, oops, something went wrong. Uh, but now it's like, we're both able to climb the wall now and we have our safety gear. So we, we have the fun, we enjoy the benefits of rock climbing. But if we fall, you know, the, the rope is gonna catch us. I certainly hope coding will never become as dangerous as climbing a mountain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd be... <laughs> all these these hacks and ransomware you'd be surprised i guess okay so let's let's break down a little further um what a function is okay so we have this thing called fibonacci um this can be called anything um as long as it's a valid name okay and we also use this uh what's called camel case so the first one's lowercase, everything else, every other word is um, capital, capitalized. Um, yeah, I'm still getting those other warnings. I'm gonna put this back in here for now. Does Dart use camel case for function names? I think so, yeah. Let's I'm only asking it. because Dart um, prefers file names to utilize the underscore in between each word. There we oh, go, fly by yeah. objects, yep. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so we've got, okay, I want to get rid of this. We read this, right? Yeah, this is all about specifying the return types. Okay. Um, yeah, as long as it's a, a valid name. Um, so this Fibonacci thing can change. It's, it's really whatever you want to call it. And naming your functions or methods, a method is a function inside of a class. Naming these, these functions, um, for human readers um, is really important. Um, so yeah, think, think long and hard about how you're gonna do that because like Jim said, you know, it's reusable. So you, you don't want um, a squirrely name. Okay. Um, and then we had our arguments list. These have to go in uh, parentheses. Sometimes like in Ruby on Rails, <laughs> I, can, I can, you know, find like, user.find with an ID of one, two, three, and I don't necessarily have to pass in argument names. Um, 
or sorry, parentheses. So like here, so when we're defining it, we have our type, we have the variable. Um, and then this thing, this block of code is called a block of code. And it is defined as being between uh, these curly braces. I think in, in Ruby, if I were to do a Ruby example, you would have like some, and we actually do it differently in, in Ruby. We use a snake case, some method, and like some args. <laughs> like so. And then you would do like a do block. And then this is where you would have your integer in. And again, like we don't specify the, the type like that. And it would be end. So Ruby also does have like the concept of uh, the curly braces. So I think you could actually just replace these if you wanted to, but you don't, you don't see Ruby coded like that very often, I don't think. People prefer to use do and end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's our block of code. That's what's gonna run um, for this thing. Okay. Now everything else in here is just like regular code. So, I mean, if you take it out, like this, this is the essence of a function. Return type name, um, typed parameters, would you call those typed parameters? Um, there's different ways to do it. Like you can say, I think like that is like optional now. Yeah, oh, it's not, it's not positional, right? So it's int. And then let's say you have like name and in advance. I don't really recall what I've learned so far. Uh, like keyword arguments, you know, named parameters. Mm. Too many positional uh, arguments. Line two. Yeah. It's expecting zero, but found. Sorry. Just do that. Is that correct? Name can have a value. No. It's advanced. Shall we? Yeah, let's figure this out. <laughs> Dart name parameters. There we go. Ah, we have a section in here. Search for it. Come on. I can't see what I'm typing because my thing is in the way. Okay. Yeah, so some APIs, notably Flutter, use only named parameters. So this is something if you're um, using Flutter, you'll see this a lot. So it's probably good that we cover it here because I think Flutter is a big use case for Dart. Okay. So that's how it's called, but what would the method signature, which is when it's defined, that's called the method signature. Um, When you define it, what does it look like? Find. Optional positionals. Okay, I guess you do brackets for optional positionals. So if we did Yeah, it's just the type and then the name. So let me go back, type and the name, right? Put that back in there, I guess. Um, so we're just gonna call this in. And then make this in. Now what do we have? Line six. 
the implicit value default values, and I'll try adding either explicit non-null default value or the required modifier. Okay, and I think that was immediately before this. Okay, this is getting hairy, Jim. You wanna keep going down this or you wanna abandon? This will take some time to play around. Yeah. Yeah, let's abandon this. Okay. Not as intuitive as, as we would have liked. Not for me anyways. There are some superheroes out there that could probably do that and not bat an eye. Okay. So, we had our, um, let's talk about separating out things into multiple functions. Um, so sometimes you can get very large, many lines of logic within a single thing. And I think a good rule of thumb is that your function should be kept small as a unit um, so that the, it just like does one thing really well. Um, and that also promotes reuse because the more complicated it gets, the more narrow its application can be uh, for reuse purposes. So for example, we could take this line and cut that. And if we wanna wrap this in a function, what does it do so we can give it a name? N is zero or N is one? Return, Return N. Determine N. So we just wanna say determine N. Um, and it's going to return an integer. I guess it would be like that, determine. Um, now, n can be the integer, so this is, um, well, it's not determining it because we're, we're passing in, we're expecting to receive an integer. We want to, let's say, abort um, when zero or one or early return. Your method and function names can, can probably be better, but um, <laughs> when in doubt, be explicit, I think is probably a good rule of thumb. Um, Tell exactly what the function is trying to do. Yeah. Okay. okay, so there is our function. Okay, um, what is my error? The body might complete normally, causing null to be returned, but the return type is potentially non nullable. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, so like when this isn't true, That's weird. I put a space there and it got rid of the, the message. <laughs> that shouldn't have been the case. Look at that. How weird is that? The body of my function when I have two spaces instead of one. I didn't save that. I don't know what it was doing. That's so weird. Okay, yeah, it shouldn't matter how many spaces you have, right? You should get the same error message. Um, adding a return or a throw statement at the end. So we can say if n is what, greater than one, then throw some error. I don't even know if that's how that's done, I'm just guessing. Rather than an independent if statement, we could also use else. Mm -hmm. So return in, so instead, so we'll do that here, return in, and we'll keep the dart way. Whoa, what just happened? Um, we'll just return, do they have like not a number? Is that a thing, undefined? I don't think they have undefined. We'll just return 
Uh oh. <laughs> but then that's going to be a string. So let's just return a number um, of zero minus one. Well, we're going to return zero to zero. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. I'm reasonably satisfied with that. So we've extracted our logic. Um, it wasn't giving us that error earlier because the second part was always taking care of this, of that, that other case. Um, but now that this could be reused in any other method, um, not just the Fibonacci, Fibonacci one, where it's now as long as it's a valid name. Uh, so now we want to return early when zero or one and pass in that same integer. So we're calling this method now. So that uh, in there is going to be passed in there. Okay. So now we should be able to run the program. It should still work. Nope. All right. We found an error. Range error. Let's go to Google. Figure this one yeah, out. Yeah, the, uh, the argument of 20 is uh, far too large. But it worked earlier, right? I thought the earlier was a number under 20. Yeah, five didn't work either. Let's go find out. So it sounds like this this uh, particular Stack Overflow post is not about Dart, but it might give us some indication. Somewhere in your code, you're calling a function, which in turn calls another function until you hit call stack limit. Almost always because a recursive function with a base case that isn't being met. Okay. So I think, let's see if I change this to a positive number, does that make a difference? Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is get rid of this else statement. So now we should get that error message again. Um, let's look at the docs here. Also, we're calling that function, but we're not doing anything with the return type. Return early when zero or one, after we pass an in, we're not doing anything with the, um, the in that's returned. Right. In the second function. Yeah. Do we, do we need to? I mean, we return it. So like, um, is that going to return out of here? It will. Okay. But during the line eight, mm -hmm. when we're calling the recursive function, it'll still use the end that's passed in, not the end that's returned from return early with zero or one. Mm -hmm. mm. So maybe we need like a variable here and reassign in. So it's passed in. Wait a minute. Instead in. of using in, use something else like uh, number or some other variable. Okay. Okay. And we can, I guess, put this back in. Yeah. How does it do that? Okay. Oh no. Maximum call stack size exceeded. Breaking the internet, Jim. Okay, the body might complete normally, causing null to be returned. Hmm. This is a return of null. So what they did is common fixes at a return statement at the end of the message. So that's like after printing. 
it's weird where you like using a class node or they have like a sure fun or a throw empty string. Yeah, I don't think that's what's causing our problem though. We have a different error now, whether we return minus one or throw. It's calling a function and a function. Let me bring back this um, stack overflow. Oops. Recursive for the case that isn't being met. The other thing, it doesn't really give us any line numbers where this is happening. You know what I mean? I wonder if we can it's add- It's internal to the browser itself. Yeah, let me just print something and run this. Okay, so it printed something and then it did the thing. So it's getting into as long as it's a valid name. So here, this is called uh, print debugging or puts debugging as we call it in Ruby. So now we're um, in the main, not the main function because that, that doesn't make sense. In the Fibonacci, okay, All right. So we'll see, we should see something in the Fibonacci. Okay, so we see what it's doing here now is it's printing all these things until it finally gets to the end. Whereas before, all we saw was the error message. We're like, what's going on? All right, so somehow, as long as it's a valid name, it's just getting called over and over and over. And the only way we're calling it is right here. So maybe it's like we get the result and it's potentially non-nullable and we try to print it so it says, oh, where do we get that? And then it calls it again. That's really the only thing I'm seeing. Oh, it's calling it um, recursively. Look at line 10. Oh, shit. It's calling well, itself. Well, isn't Fibonacci supposed to call itself? It's supposed to call itself, but the browser <laughs> doesn't like it in this instance. <laughs> because we have this, we've extracted this bit. Um, yeah. Okay, let's put this back in. Get rid of this one. Okay, change these back to in. Okay. So now, hello. Okay, it doesn't like that that's still part of the program. Get rid of that. Okay, so this Fibonacci sequence, right? It goes like one, one, two, one, two, three. And so it's probably like however many times um, is how many times it printed this. Okay, so there was something about <laughs> extracting this into its own method that it did not like. So I think just something to watch out for, right? And hopefully you'll have better luck than we did if you encounter that. Okay, I'm plugged in now. Thoughts, Jim? I like it. It's a real example like functions of functions in this language. This is a real example. Well, for one, of it's very uh, similar to the languages that I've used in the past. Yeah. With a little tweak here and there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, I mean, it's, it's kind of contrived um, in the sense that we're really not usually going to call a Fibonacci sequence. Um, let me paste this back in here as it was. I'll just rename this to Fibonacci. Um, I think it's good that in the documentation they have 
a recursive function because it introduces the function itself, but then it also kind of shows you, hey, you can call the function. Um, for somebody who's starting out though, that's like brand new to programming, this might even be a little advanced, the recursive nature of it. Someone who's um, just starting out, like they literally yesterday were like, I'd like to become a programmer. And they <laughs> somehow landed on the dark docs and they're going through this. The recursive bit might be a little much, especially if you haven't had like, um, I, I think like wherever they teach this, which is higher mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. um, calculus. It shows maybe? you what's possible. I don't remember, yeah. It shows you what's possible, but it could be confusing for someone just starting out. Um, I want to do my own function. So I think the the contrived one you see a lot of times is like um, double the number or something, or add two numbers. Okay, and we'll take two positional arguments like an integer x and an integer y. And then you just return x plus y. Okay. And then let's say we'll, we'll take your advice from earlier, Jim, and just throw it directly into the print statement. Um, I might be able to do this on two lines and see what that looks like. Looks kind of gross, but we'll just go with it for now. Maybe we'll put it back on one line. Add two numbers, seven and two. It's the best poker hand. Okay. And I don't need, I didn't like that semicolon. No, because uh, you're passing add two numbers as an argument to print. It's not an independent statement in and of itself. You don't need the semicolon. Ah, nice. So that, that kind of threw me off because, <laughs> because I broke this out into its own line, whereas uh -huh. previously you might do something like this where the it's all in yeah, one line. Yeah, that makes more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we had a semicolon in there, that would that that would stand out to me as like that's that doesn't look right. Good deal. Cool. We printed nine. All right. So to avoid the recursive nature of things, we have our return type of the function, the function name. We have our two positional arguments. Uh, with their types declared. We have a block of code. So those curly braces. Um, and then here's our logic where we're returning the value. And because this is written in such a way that when you give it two integers, it returns an integer. That makes that return type an integer. Um, I guess it, yeah. Okay. Cool. Then this, this is actually a good example for uh, the shorthand, you, you might see this as called the fat arrow because it has like two lines versus like a single minus sign line. So the arrow syntax is handy for functions that contain a single statement. Syntax is especially useful when passing anonymous functions as arguments. Okay. So, so just reading this line right here, yeah, we have a flyby object, which can be assumed is a list, and we're trying to filter it down. And it's calling where filter mm -hmm. where the name contains turn. Okay, filters out by that. And for each of those filtered items, print it out. Mm -hmm. So that's the anonymous function. Let's let's do the fat arrow real quick. And then we'll come back and, and actually do flyby objects. How's that sound? Okay. Sounds good. So I wish there was, there's probably a shortcut in an IDE where you can say, turn this into fat arrow syntax, but we're just gonna do it manually. Like so. So like sometimes I wonder if you could do that. Is that legitimate? That looks legitimate to me. Thinking, thinking, spit out nine. Um, so that's also a way to have a function on one line, but you can get rid of these because it looks kind of squirrely and do that fat arrow like that. So now this single line, and in fact, look at that unexpected text return. You don't even need that because the return I think is implied 
in the, the shorthand. Okay. Cool. And that can really help out when you have like- Hey, Aaron, change the yeah. int to avoid in the signature. That? Yeah. Okay. It's a value can't be used. Uh, so it's still going to return the, the integer, but we can't use it uh, when called. Ah, but it's possible to use void with the fat arrow. I think so. Yeah, let's 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 try it. Um, so we just say print x plus y. Isn't that what we would want to do? Mm -hmm. And then instead of print here, because we have our print statement and add two numbers. We would just call add two numbers and expect that to do the printing for us. And let's just give it three, and expect 10. Yeah. There we go. Very nice, Jim. Cool. Okay, and then you were saying fly by objects. Let's take this logic and we'll throw this into main. I'm just gonna comment this out. That out. Uh, we need to define flyby objects. Um, that's going to be a list. Let's call it left turn, right turn, and fancy. No turn for you. And we'll have ourselves a list. And let's be super explicit. It's a list of strings. Okay, so now there, actually I'm gonna delete this because it's cluttering the space. I'm gonna just focus. All right, semicolon. So that's declared. Um, all right, so flyby objects is a list. It probably has this thing called where. So flyby objects, and then you say dot, and it brings up a list of things you can use. So these are, um, like methods, these are functions in the list class. So they're methods uh, you can call on this, this list instance of a list. And one of them is where, um, yeah. And I think that when you look at this, that arrow indicates the return type, it returns an iterable of strings. Mm. I guess. And a full function string test. It takes in a know. function, and if it triggers okay. true, it does something. Okay. Okay, well, let's use it. C. So fly by objects where the name contains turn. Okay, so there's two of those. Print each of them. Um, so we're expecting to print left turn, right turn, but fancy will not be printed. Nice. Okay. The reason we're showing this is um, that the fat arrow right here, this is a function definition. We've defined this function. It doesn't have a name. It's an anonymous function because it doesn't have a name like um, do this thing, right? Where you have that uh, argument. Okay. So these are sort of ad hoc one-time use types of things. Um, whereas if we wanted to reuse this, we wanted to give it a name. Um, we're gonna call this, it's a bool, right? That's what it needed to return. Yes. Yeah, what type is Boolean? Have we done Booleans yet? Boolean? Jim's favorite function. And it takes a name, right? So that's a string. I think the Boolean type is just bool, B-O-O-L. Lowercase, because it's so basic, like, like I-N-T. Yeah, should be a primitive type. Okay. All right, so Jim's favorite function takes in this. Now, this is the logic 
So I'm just gonna cut this out of here. All right, boom. Okay, now instead of passing in the name and doing the fat arrow in here, we're gonna use Jim's favorite function, pass in the name. Now this is interesting because previously the anonymous function took in it needs an expression where you have to put parentheses name fat arrow and then the the defined function let's see if that works oh we we need to like invoke it it, it needs a um, it needs an expression error in the very front uh-huh Parentheses name. Okay. Fat arrow. Yeah, let's see. Now run it, see if it works. Also, I, the function needs to return true or false. Which is a bull, right? Yeah, so this needs to be. Um, Just add a return and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So name on a string. And if I say name dot, let's see, does it have contains? It does. Okay, so it's something we can use. So that's what I was doing. I needed access to that. So I just got myself a little string there for a second. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah, let's run this again. Okay. Ah, it works. And the reason why is it needs a function expression. That's what mm -hmm. the info notes said, rather than just a function. Okay. So this is, this is an interesting point. Um, a, what is the difference in a, a function expression and the other thing you said? Just, a function. just a function? <laughs> yeah. Well, where it acts as a filter, but what what does it filter you have to tell it what to filter mm -hmm. and so, how it filters is where for where object name item name and if it contains turn true or false execute the where and in this case um the name contains the the word turn Okay, okay. So now let me, let me do something really quick. I'm gonna turn this thing into a fat arrow because this is what we extracted from. Um, this was previously up here, right? This logic, and we gave it a name. So this, so there's like two pieces is what I see. Previously, we had an anonymous function because the logic was just here without a name. That was the anonymous function, not the entire thing, which I right. took The out. entire thing is a um, function expression. Yeah, so this thing, this fat arrow syntax belongs to more of like the where clause. Because um, I don't, I guess you could do this. I don't know, um, but this, this sort of name here, this is really, we have flyby objects. So this is really an object. This is, this is the local variable that we're pulling out to represent each of these strings, right? Each of those. We're but each of these items, what do you want mm -hmm. to do with it? Yeah. In this yeah. case, we want to check if that item contains the word turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this is our thing here. So in like, what I'm familiar with in Ruby is if we had flyby objects like this, we would say dot where do object. And then we'd have end down there. 
and we would say something like Jim's favorite function, right? And pass in the object. So this sort of invocation, that's this thing right here. In C sharp, there's a library called Link, L I N K. Yeah. Language integrated query that is pretty much exactly the same as this. Where hmm. when it comes to whatever objects, there's a collection of methods you can call mm -hmm. where map, aggregate, select, so on. And it pretty nice. much uses the fat arrow syntax too. It does. Okay. So this is the, the function expression is. Um, passing, it's like a function within a function is what it looks like to me. Would that be a misnomer or would that be a, a good characterization? I don't know any other way to describe it except for what the documentation says is it requires a function expression. <laughs> okay, and you were saying that because you had dot where? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so you, you said it requires a function expression. I said it looks like a function within a function, meaning that somewhere this where function is defined um, because uh, the list has access to it. So it's probably like a, a Dart list has where. Let's go look it up, Dart list where. List class. Well, there's the where method right there. I'll find it first where. And there's a bunch of where's, okay. Yeah, so this is what we saw earlier with this bool. And then you had, it was a little bit different, but I remember how it returned the iterable. Um, and then it's where time. Returns a new lazy iterable with all elements that satisfy the predicate test. That's Take a look at it. Yeah, these docs sometimes are, are hard to read from like a usage point of view. Like this doesn't tell me to say dot where and but I guess it's just a matter of getting used to this, right? Because this is that function expression you were talking about. Mm -hmm. That's what this and is the right The first here. part prior to the fat arrow is the quote unquote predicate test. So this is a predicate test. Okay, nice. Is that is that what they called it here? Predicate test. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. That satisfy the predicate test. And what do we want to test it? Well, it's the clause after the fat arrow. Okay. Nice. So this is this is our test some function called where iterable, right? And this could have been an anonymous thing or we could have extracted it out and named it like this was Jim's favorite function earlier, right? Um, okay, cool. So this was helpful because now I can look at this and read it a little bit more clearly. Um, yeah. got to get used to that notation. It still looks a little alien to me. All right, cool. Well, that was a good example. Um, let's see what else we got. Besides showing an anonymous function, the argument to where this code shows that you can use a function as an argument. The top level print function is an argument to for each. That was kind of cool too. So I said for each print. Um, so this is a way we like, we supplied to the for each method, the command to print that we normally do just by itself. 
right? Aaron, I wonder if that's shorthand for each um, pass in the, the print function. Mm -hmm. I guess it automatically knows what to print because it's chained onto the where mm -hmm. method. Yeah. Yeah, you could probably also just get rid of this where method. Okay, I'm just gonna, I cut that and I'm gonna paste it here and comment it out. So fly by objects for each print. And now we should have all three. You know, Aaron, ah, okay. Let's see if we can be more explicit. Try adding the predicate test, parentheses um, name, for example, within for okay. each. Within for each. Yep. Okay. Yep. Parentheses so for name. Each object. Oops. And then we want to that add arrow. object. Yeah. Let's see we, if we can be explicit. Look at that. There you go. All right. Beautiful. There is, in Ruby, <laughs> a way to do this as well. And I think we call it the um, symbol to proc um, is what it's called there. And what this would look like is, so normally you have like, fly by objects and you would say each and then you would say do or you, you can also do this bracket thing so then we would have our object like so and then we would have our logic which in ruby is puts object okay so we'd have something like that and because it's so redundant to just pass in like one object and do something simple with it, like a one-liner. Um, or let's say we were saying like, um, like object dot um, capitalize. So we take the string and we're capitalizing each of them. Um, instead, it just provides some syntactic sugar to do this sort of thing. And what that reminds me of is it's just a shorthand way to say, well, this is just very verbose, like you're saying, or explicit to print the object. Um, we know we're passing in the object. So if we just call print, we should be able to like see what that does, right? Aaron, um, comment out line five. Mm -hmm. Sure. And on line four, call where, yeah. But instead of explicitly using the function expression, what if we just put Jim's favorite function? Mm -hmm. So earlier we had the object, the fat arrow, Jim's favorite function with object. And so now we just want to say Jim's favorite function. And it's expecting the thing to go in there, right? So now if I print it, it should just be the two. There we go. Nicely done. Wow. Okay. I'm glad you're here, Jim. This has made this, this session immensely more valuable. It's good stuff. I appreciate that. Glad to be here. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a really good thing to notice. Um, and then also apply. So I think this is amazing. So. <laughs> We have literally a screen's worth of like two methods on functions. And there was the bit with the uh, recursiveness. Um, and then we had the fat arrow syntax and anonymous functions. But then there was also this little bit here. And, and we kind of just played with it until we realized, let's say we, uh, Jim, Jim takes the credit here. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff in this little package, this, this one screen on functions, right? I like how that it doesn't hold your hand. It just tells you, hey, this is what's possible <laughs> and it's for you to figure out the details. 
Yeah, that can be nice unless you're new and you get overwhelmed um, or you, <laughs> you, you, you can't appreciate um, what, what it's trying to like, like it could be like right in front of your face, but if you, if you can't appreciate it, it's, it's, it's not going to sink in. Um, which I think is the idea behind these videos annotating the documentation is so we can help people appreciate some of the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the whole point. Okay. And then besides showing an anonymous, okay, that we did this. <laughs> yep. Okay. So it pointed it out, um, but that's as much hand holding as they were going to give us, right? Correct. Um, Yeah, and it, what's what's interesting is it we passed in print the reference to the function. We didn't pass in an invocation, which is when you have the um, the parentheses on the end. Okay, um, cool. I, I think I've seen that in JavaScript too, where you can do that. Sometimes you call it without the parentheses, and sometimes you call it with. You use the line JavaScript. Nice. Okay. Wow, that's it for functions.